Welcome back, my little scientists. In this lesson, I will go over various atomic models. So I will cover the evolution of atomic models. I will only cover some of them, not all of them, and just bas the basics, essentially. All right, so let's begin. So first, we need to know what is an atom. So an atom is the smallest particle of matter. It cannot be divided chemically. It is what we call indivisible, and that word comes from the Greek atomos, and that's why atoms are called atoms. It started with the Greeks. Greek philosophers were talking about matter when we were trying to explain where matter was coming from, and that's how the whole thing started. Now, we know that matter can be divided. We now know that there are subparticles, so particles inside the atom. So what we now say is that the atom is the smallest component of an element having the chemical properties of that element. So in other words, if I take an atom of copper and I split it open, it's no longer copper. It will not have the chemical properties of copper. So I need to have a full atom to have, uh, for it to be able to show its chemical properties. Okay, so we are going to go over the following uh, models, Dalton's, Thomson's, Rutherford's, the Rutherford-Bohr model, and simplified atomic model. So why do we use models? We use models to represent something that is so small that we cannot see it with the naked eye. So it's a visual representation of a reality that we can explain, but that we cannot necessarily see. So if we start with Dalton's atomic model, he said that atoms are very, very small and cannot be divided. He said that all atoms of the same element are identical. They're identical in mass, in size, in chemical properties, and so on and so forth. So they would look exactly alike in terms of mass, size, and how they behave. His next set statement says that atoms of different elements are different. That makes sense, right? So if I have two different atoms of two different elements, they will look different and they will have different properties. Lastly, chemical reactions form new substances without creating, dividing, or destroying atoms. Atoms only rearrange. So think of Lego blocks that you use to uh, create a certain construction, if you undid that construction and created something else out of the same Legos, well, you're not creating Legos, you're not dividing Legos, you're not breaking them in, in pieces, you're not destroying them, you're just rearranging them. So it's the same idea. So if we take the following reaction, carbon that reacts with oxygen gas to form carbon dioxide, we have atoms of carbon, or one atom of carbon, that reacts with two atoms of oxygen, Everything gets separated, kind of splits apart, and rearranges to make carbon dioxide. So I have the same number of atoms of oxygen. I have two, and I have one carbon of uh, one atom of carbon, sorry, on each side of the equation. So nothing was created, nothing was destroyed, everything was rearranged. And that is in line with the law of conservation of matter. And it's the law of conservation of matter that influenced how Dalton saw atoms and how he created his atomic model. We represent atoms, or he represented atoms, just like spheres. There's nothing else to it. It's just round spheres of different sizes to represent different atoms. So that's Dalton, Dalton's model. The next one is Thomson's atomic model. So Thomson did some, uh, ex performed some experimentations, one of which was using cathode ray tubes. And in the glass tube, you had a cathode, so a negative, um, a negative end to it. There was a positive end called an anode, and the electricity would flow through. And at the end of the anode, there was a little hole, and he saw, he observed that some light was created and was flowing through and was being reflected on a screen at the end. So he said, ooh, electricity is made of something that is is kind of made of light because it creates a light at the end, but at the same time, it behaved also like matter. And that's how essentially through these experimentations that he came across, or he discovered, I should say, the electron. So his experiment on cathode ray tubes led him to the discovery of the electron. So we went from Dalton with this sphere, and now Thomson adds the electron to this. 
So he said that the atom is positively charged, it's a ball, it's still a sphere, but inside we find electrons that are scattered. It is divisible because we find electrons inside. So because he was able to determine that there were subparticles, the electrons, there had to be a way to divide the atom. We call this model the plum pudding. The plum pudding or the muffin. So in other words, it's like a muffin, which is a positive dough with negative raisins in it. Okay, so it looks a little bit like this, a positive sphere with negative electrons floating around in no particular order. There's no structure to that. Okay, so the dough itself, the atom itself, the sphere is positive and the electrons are just floating around inside. Next, we have Rutherford's atomic model. So Rutherford, what he did, he took a radioactive substance and that radio radioactive substance was emitting alpha particles. They're very tiny, positively charged particles. And those particles were, were aimed at a gold foil. So think of aluminum, uh, a piece of aluminum foil, but it was a gold foil. So a very thin leaf of gold. And as he was sending those uh, rays, those alpha particles on the foil, what he observed was that some of them would reflect back. So he had a screen around it. So some of these particles would reflect back and create a little bit of light when they would hit the screen. Some of them would go straight through and some of them would go through, but would then be deflected. They would go a little bit sideways. So they wouldn't continue straight. So there were really three types of observations that he made. So that led him to the following conclusions. So there is a positive charge inside the atom and it seems to be in the center of the atom, but it's very, very, very tiny. So he essentially discovered the protons and the nucleus. So he said the protons would be in the middle inside the nucleus, inside the tiny bit of matter, and the rest of the atom is mostly empty. So that would, would explain why some of the alpha particles would go straight through because they would go through the empty space some of the alpha particles were hitting the nucleus and bouncing back, so it's very dense, and some would pass near the nucleus and be deflected, would be pushed away. Why? Because these alpha particles are positive and the protons inside the nucleus are also positive. And we know that two uh, items or particles of the same kind will repel each other. So a positive with a positive, those two would repel each other, causing the alpha particles to change direction. So they were going straight and now they start going a little bit sideways. So this is a summary of what he observed and what conclusions he uh, drew. So most alpha particles went through undeflected. The atom is mostly empty. Some bounce back. So that means there's a tiny amount of matter inside the atom and it's bigger than the alpha particles. So this was basically uh, him observing that there is a nucleus. Some were slightly deflected, so that nucleus has to be positively charged. So he discovered the proton at the same time. And metals with greater atomic mass deflected more particles. So he redid the same experiment with other metals than gold sheets. And the heavier the metal, the more particles were being deflected, indicating that the mass in the center of the atom was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the bigger the mass of the atom, the bigger the nucleus. So this is how he represented his atom. So there's a lot of, there's protons in the center where the nucleus is. It's a tiny, tiny amount of matter. The rest of the atom is mostly empty and the electrons are floating around in no particular order. There is no structure inside that atom. So sometimes you're going to see something that looks like this to represent the Rutherford uh, model. It's an incorrect way of showing it. They're trying to show you that the electrons are moving around the nucleus, but these lines, these kind of circles that they're drawing are misleading because it, it, makes, it makes it look like there's an actual structure and there's not. Rutherford did not say that there was a structure uh, inside the atom where you would find the electrons. The electrons were just free floating. So this incorrect way of representing the Rutherford model. From there, his acolyte, Mr. Bohr, Niels Bohr, 
uh, made a few observations. So Niels Bohr, he improved on Rutherford's model. So he said, why is it that uh, the electrons that Thomson had discovered, why don't they collapse onto the nucleus? You know, the nucleus is positive, the electrons are negative, they should be attracted to each other. So why is it that the electrons don't fall onto the nucleus? That's very strange. And so he said, well, there must be a structure preventing the electrons from doing this. And he called those orbits. So he's the one who introduced orbits to the uh, atom inside the, in the atom, the atomic model. So this is what it looks like. So you have the nucleus in the center, very tiny, very dense, so full of positive particles, and you have orbits on which you find electrons. So the nucleus is very small, positively charged, contains the protons, it is surrounded by negatively charged electrons moving in definite orbits. We also call them energy levels or shells. And the last model, the simplified atomic model. So that's again an improvement on the one we just covered. And this one was, was uh, basically created by Chadwick. So Mr. Chadwick, he was comparing atoms of hydrogen and helium. And he said, okay, hydrogen has one proton and helium has two protons. So the mass of helium should be twice the mass of hydrogen. But in his observations, he saw that actually helium was four times heavier than hydrogen. So he couldn't figure out at first, why would that be? It doesn't make sense. So then he realized there has to be another particle inside the atom. And he says, we'll call it the neutron. So those two extra mass units were basically um, accounted for by two neutrons. So also it allowed him to explain why the nucleus doesn't explode. If you recall, there's a bunch of protons inside the nucleus. So why don't they repel each other? Well, the neutrons, because they're carrying no charge, they're very neutral, right? Um, they keep the protons apart so they can't repel each other and blow up the nucleus. A little bit like, you know, parents when, when siblings argue, well, they might get in the middle of the fight to separate them. So just like the neutrons get in between protons to prevent them from pushing each other away and blowing up the whole nucleus. So this is what the uh, model looks like. So you now have protons and neutrons inside the tiny dense nucleus and you have electrons revolving around that nucleus on specific orbits or shells or energy levels. So those prevent the electrons from collapsing or being attracted to the nucleus. So they're staying at a fair distance. So that's a simplified atomic model. And that's it. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. Have a good one.